Hello, I'm Adele Stern, welcoming you to this episode of the San Luis Obispo League of Women Voters Education Fund series, Slow Democracy, brought to you through the courtesy of Charter Communications. The League of Women Voters has been a politically oriented organization in the United States since its inception in 1920. We've been your neighbors here in San Luis Obispo since 1960 and have welcomed men as members since 1972. The focus of these programs will be issues of interest to the local community and to the voter. We hope to bring you some educational programs, but when we bring you controversial programs, we will let the speakers of the issues speak for themselves. If we can't have the proponents and opponents here, we will explain why. Since this is an encouragement to the voter to be informed, we hope you look for us on your dial and check the time of our programs. But for now, I'd like you to join us for today's guests. We are having a different format today. The next three programs are part of a panel discussion that the League of Women Voters had at the school board meeting room of the San Luis Coastal Board at the San Luis High School. We are moderated by Boyd Horn, and the program is covering water, water sources, water availability, and water quality in San Luis Obispo County. This meeting was open to the public and will be broken into three segments for your viewing pleasure. Please join us. Now, water doesn't deliver itself. You need organizations to figure out how to deliver that water. And I'd like uh, Christine, then Susan, then Ken, then Tom, to talk about organizations that deliver the water. Yes, um, well, you can think that for the uh, residents of this county, one of the primary entities that delivers water are our cities, municipalities. You can think many cities here, um, Morro Bay, San Luis Obispo, Aurora Grande, Grover Beach, et cetera, et cetera, do have city water departments that actually are responsible for operating the, the wells or the reservoirs that deliver the water to our, to our taps. We'll talk in the next segment a bit about water quality and how that aspect of our water delivery is monitored and, and uh, maintained over the years. But uh, basically, the cities here um, are the main purveyors of water to citizens of our county. The one exception to that is, is me sitting here, and that's the community of Atascadero. Atascadero actually has no city water department. They're served by a mutual water company, and that's my current employer is the mutual water company, and it's a little bit of a different entity. If you were a resident of Atascadero, we may have some here. You turn on your tap, and everything works just the same as if we were a city department, but we are actually a separate entity. There's also a community services district. Some of you may belong. I think the larger ones here are uh, Cambria, Nipomo, and Los Osos come to mind at this time. And the community services districts are uh, a, a different example of a utility. They are managed by an elected, an elected board of officials that oversee the operations of the water delivery in, in those communities. And I mentioned Atascadero being served by a mutual water company. There's many other examples of much smaller mutual water companies. I think, Boyd, you mentioned that you're on the board of your um, mutual water company where you live. Oftentimes, those are set up to serve rather small developments, it's perhaps some residential developments that uh, all agree, hey, let's not operate individual wells. Let's pool our money together. We'll operate a common storage reservoir, perhaps two wells, et cetera, et cetera. So those are a common in a smaller group of residences that are perhaps isolated from a larger community system. The outside of the larger urban areas that are administered by a city or a elected board of a CSD, there's the next step down where you're big enough to be urban, but you're still too small for any form of self-governance. You form a county service area, and the CSAs are administered by, actually through the engineering department of the county, and the board of directors is the board of supervisors. Act, you know, they, they take off their board hats, and then they put on their water district hats, and they per, are, become the controlling body for the water purveyance system in a CSD. And in our county, San Miguel, San, um, Shandon, portions of Cayucas, and in the Avila Valley um, for managing the Lopez water that goes to the Avila Valley are all CSAs. 
then if you're in an even smaller community and you haven't formed a mutual water company, you can also form a water district. And Garden Farms is the only one that comes to mind as a separate community water district. And then on the bigger picture, we also have the Department of Water Resources who administer the state water project. And they are actually a wholesaler. They wholesale the water to us, and then we become the broker who distributes it to the local agencies who are the actual retailers. So there's all, overall, it, it's a, an amazing combination of types of agencies that have their governing power and serve. And they're generally a function of how big their service area is. I'd like to uh, comment a little bit upon uh, the political ramifications um, and the situations that have just been described. It's interesting that uh, in the county where we have unincorporated uh, communities like Templeton and uh, Cambria and, and Cayucas and Napomo, uh, where there is a private water company that serves some of those people, uh, not in all of them, but in some of those, you have a dichotomy between land use and water. The county retains the right to determine what the land use is going to be, and the private water company determines whether they're going to furnish water or whether they want to furnish water, and can they have the capability of furnishing water. And that causes some very, very interesting um, conflicts. One is profit-making, the other is trying to uh, make uh, intelligent land uses not only based upon the availability of resources, but all of the other social, uh, environmental ramifications that come along with determining whether land is to be residential, stay agriculture, go into industry, retailing, and so forth. So those conflicts make decision-making about water very difficult in those circumstances. I wanted to add that. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, through the years of, uh, of uh, trying to, imp uh, uh, how would you say, impact the, uh, the uh, planning process with, uh, with the issue of water availability uh, we uh, uh, we have gone to the uh, county general plan, which uh, contains a uh, a, uh, a resource management uh, system as part of the general plan, which uh, equates uh, the, uh, the current annual re annually reviews everything from uh, traffic to uh, to water supply, and. Uh, it's, uh, the problem has been that in the decision-making process, uh, the, uh, uh, the analysis of, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, water resources issue has been ignored in, uh, by the decision-makers. And uh, this is one of the things that needs to be uh, uh, acknowledged and, and, uh, and the general public <laughs> come forward and and uh, see to it that their uh, politicians uh, uh, implement the, uh, the, the, uh, the resource management system. And, and uh, uh, I'll change the subject a little bit here and talk about Zone 3 for a minute. But we're not going to go too far away from it. But anyway, the, the Zone 3, uh, district was formed when the uh, bond issue was uh, voted on to uh, build Lopez Lake in the 60s. And uh, Zone 3 is an advisory committee to the Board of Supervisors who has the ultimate decision to do whatever takes place, whether it's work, raise water rates or put a bond issue on the ballot or something. And I'm looking at Mrs. Bianchi because that's going to be coming up here very shortly. And uh, so it is made up of seven members. Uh, each city has a, has a member, the agricultural group has a member, and the uh, uh, public at large has a member. But anyway, we're responsible for 
the wholesaling of water, as Susan mentioned a minute ago. And uh, we have a safe yield of 8,730 acre feet a year that we work with. And out of that 8,700 feet, there's uh, 4,530 that goes to the municipal uh, communities of Arroyo Grande, Oceano, Bismo Beach, and Grover. And it also goes on out to Avila Beach. There are 4,200 acre feet that are designated for under uh, recharge, under underground recharge, or that all of the little community wells, uh, along with Arroyo's well and, and Grover's well, pump that from the aquifer, along with all the agricultural people. And to tag in on some of the numbers that Susan was talking about with the several hundred thousand acre feet that the county uses over a period of a year. With the Zone 3 retrofit taking place where we can utilize the entire uh, safe yield of the dam and the capacity of the dam uh, with 8,700 acre feet of water a year in a 30 year period, which the bond issue, if it passes or the retrofit is going to be paid off in, will generate somewhere around 250,000 acre feet of water for the five cities area. And so I think that uh, we have done a reasonable, well job of managing this, and I think this came up the other day at the RAC, that uh, before we did have a problem a few years ago, uh, we established the South County uh, Gentlemen's Agreement where all of the pumpers agreed not to pump any more water than they were prior to, to the uh, what they were pumping before Lopez Lake was put in place. So far, we've stayed with that, and... Uh, we're working well, but we have a couple other issues that are coming down the line. Okay. Now, Ken, minutes. you can go ahead. Footnote by Ken. I have to tie in with what Bill said uh, between the decision makers and plans. Um, I want to read to you uh, one paragraph from the 1981-82 uh, grand jury report. Um, of, of 44 conclusions, number 14 stands out. It states in part... Nacia Middle Water to be delivered to the Upper Salinas, North Coastal, and Central Coastal study areas beginning in, can you guess? 1975. <laughs> and State Water Project Water to be delivered to the San Luis Obispo Bay and South Central study areas beginning in 1980. Where was the leadership? You know, at the county level, to start relating the water planning with the land use planning. It wasn't there. And this also goes on to state, I happen to be a member of the, that grand jury, um, <laughs> that uh, never in the history of the water advisory body and uh, has it met with either the County Planning Commission or with the Board of the Supervisors directly. Uh, Bill says I, that hasn't changed. And I guess that's why we call the TV series Slow Democracy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, touch upon water quality and uh, bring this uh, segment to a close and we'll have, uh, and then we're going to ask uh, any questions from the audience. Uh, uh, so water quality, uh, Christine, Bill, and Susan, if you could touch upon how do we ensure that we have quality water? Now, one of my most frequent contacts with the public now has to deal with water quality. My water smells funny. It's staining my plumbing. What I get all kinds of uh, comments that come through, oftentimes from people that don't even reside within our service area, I'll get calls. Uh, but it's uh, obviously water quality is something very near and dear to us. We all have our own standard of what we think a good glass of water ought to taste like. And, it, I, and I, too, carry that. I'm, I'm from <coughs> Pennsylvania. That's where I grew up. That's the best tasting water in the world to me. And I'm sure you each have your individual opinions, too. But uh, you may ask yourself, and uh, uh, sometimes the public greets their water purveyor with some degree of skepticism about water quality. Well, what hoops exactly does your water purveyor have to jump through? What do they have to monitor and regulate at, in order to ensure that the product that is delivered to you, your tap is suitable for drinking for you, the young children in your life, et cetera, et cetera? Primarily, water purveyors that deliver water for, for domestic use, must uh, operate their system under a water supply permit. And that permit is issued by the Department of Health Services. That's a state department. 
And in San Luis Obispo County, we're actually governed by the health services office that's located in Santa Barbara. We have a very diligent, very alert health services staff located in our Santa Barbara office. I can, I can vouch for that. What they do is they look at each individual system and they say, all right, where exactly are you getting water supply from to deliver to the people in your service area? And they look at, well, how uh, close are these wells to, say, uh, running streams or ponds of water that might have some uh, waterborne um, organisms in it that may be a threat, if you will, to water quality. They look at how deep the wells are drilled. They look how deep the sanitary seal is that protects the water that actually enters that particular well. They look at many, many individual factors. And then based on that, they say, all right, for you and able to uh, deliver that water for domestic use, you must do, and they list out a whole litany of things that a purveyor must do. They list out a whole litany of elements that must be tested for. And uh, periodically, we just, just don't do one test and walk away. They're oftentimes done quarterly, some done annually. And uh, uh, actually, what our health services department is doing is enforcing the Title 22 water code provisions to make sure that what we're receiving is a quality substance. And I know that uh, the health services is now requiring something that's called a consumer confidence report. And some of you may have seen these delivered to your home. It's a very uh, comprehensive description of where your water comes that comes to your tap. It's a very comprehensive description of the quality of that water, how often it's tested for and for what constituents. So I would be looking for that. We, at Atascadero Mutual published ours, I believe it was April, that it was distributed to our customers. The city of San Luis Obispo, I know, has distributed their consumer confidence report. But look for yours. That's a very, very good description of the water that's coming to your home. Uh, my subject was the um, county's responsibility uh, for systems that are not covered by DHS or where Title 22 uh, designates uh, environmental health, county environmental health, to uh, to monitor uh, water quality, and uh, essentially it's the smaller systems, uh, uh, fewer than 200 service connections that uh, are uh, the county's responsibility or uh, local health officers as they're called, and. Uh, they, uh, they uh, I think, on an annual basis, uh, uh, sample the service, I'm not sure of this, but, uh, and uh, uh, test the water for the uh, standard uh, uh, biological uh, constituents that are associated with uh, health and safety. And uh, the county uh, has a, 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 a certified lab uh, to, uh, to accomplish this. The biggest factor on water quality isn't so much the distribution system as it's the actual source of the water. The pollutants, it, it is much easier to purify clean water to drinkable potable standards than it is to take polluted water and fully purify the pollutants out and then treat it to a potable level. So the um, water quality of your supply is actually, in, in the big picture, more important than the caliber and the conscientiousness of the people in your distribution system. And the responsibility for ensuring quality of the waters of the state of California falls to the Regional Water Quality Control Board. And they are responsible for implementing the Clean Water Act, which was a federal um, Act and also the Cologne Porter Act, which is the state, basically it's the state version of the Clean Water Act, and I, I think it came before Clean Water. I'm not sure on that, but they are, they look at all water sources and they look at all the beneficial uses of water. It's not just drinking water, but it's recreational use of water. It is wildlife needs for water. It is fish migration passage. Uh, every beneficial use of water comes under the regional board's jurisdiction. They get involved in surface water and groundwater. Some of the things that fall in 
their responsibilities as underground storage tanks. You know, when you see the gas stations dug up, that's because the regional board is concerned with the leaking underground storage tanks. They are conducting a lot of rangeland management classes where they're teaching ranchers better ways of managing sediment runoff from their pasture lands. They are working with the Farm Bureau in teaching uh, pesticide and fertilizer management you know, better ways of putting less on their crops so that less runs off or doing cover crops so that um, pesticides are not as necessary. They are working a lot in what's called watershed management, where instead of looking at specific point sources of solution, where, say, an equipment maintenance yard or a sewage treatment plant, they're looking at all the little things in a watershed. What is each property owner doing on their property that or the water treatment plant in any other city? But if you haven't, you should. It's a very interesting tour to see how your water is manufactured. And I think that's the term that the operators of the plant likely to use. First time I went out there and saw our water being manufactured, I was really amazed at the treatment. I'd invite uh, any of you people who are in this room to see if you can arrange, uh, and I think it can well be done, a time to go out and look at our water treatment plant up Stenner Creek. Thank you, Ken. Uh, now, two or three questions. We're running a little late, but that's okay. Uh, two or three questions from the audience, uh, and Sarah will circulate the microphone. Uh, by the way, we're going to come to uh, much more exciting parts of this presentation. <laughs> <clears throat> so you may want to save a question for that, but first question. Bill Bianchi, what has happened to the proposal by the Water Advisory Committee to monitor the amount of water that is being pumped out of private wells to report exactly how much water is being used throughout the county? Uh, one, of the, one of the problems uh, in accessing any information, well, the, let's, put, let's start with the, the fact that one of the things that the RAC's consulting study uh, concluded was that there's uh, a monstrous inadequacy in, in data relative to water resources. And wells are pri private property. And uh, in order to access any information on those wells requires the uh, consent of the owner of the uh, well. I'd like to touch on that also with just an analogy. How would you feel if a law was passed that said you have to report to us how much ice cream you eat every week or every month or every year? And we are going to compile this. And if you don't fill out your form, we're going to come in and we're going to check out your freezer. And we'll get what you bought from the grocery store, we'll get information from the grocery stores how much they're selling, but we have to know how much you're making at home. And it becomes a private property protective issue. And how much water people use is a closely held secret. Because if you're making it at home, the next thing, you know, the people who are afraid of government regulation and governments not just asking how much water are we pumping, but next year they're going to tell us how much we can pump, not ask how much we have pumped, but they're going to prohibit us. And it gets down to, with the ice cream analogy, next year we're going to demand to know your recipe. And if you're Ben and Jerry's, that's a pretty serious issue. For the agriculturalists, it's an incredibly critical issue to make sure that they are not regulated in their water consumption. Because to them, water is livelihood. And it's a very critical issue. And it, right now, our laws do not permit us to collect that information. We have to go with voluntary participation where people see in the big picture it's important to share this resource and manage it correctly. But management is a four-letter word when you talk to most agriculturalists because it's a private property right. Why the gates on Lopez Dam weren't put in the beginning? Why were they sent over to Millerton, as I understand it? Lopez was built just exactly the way it was supposed to be built. And uh, unfortunately, there were no real large floodgates put in. There's a 42-inch valve in the bottom that uh, can be opened up in, if necessary. But it was just, yeah. 
This was designed mainly for the overflow to go down the spillway at Lopez Lake. For uh, Salinas, which is the reservoir you're talking about, Santa Margarita Lake, uh, that was built by the Army Corps of Engineers uh, to serve a war purpose. The war came to an end and they decided they didn't need the extra water, so they didn't install the gate. Does anybody, has anybody, or is anybody measuring the aquifers? Does anybody know what's there? What's your baseline? And then who's drawing from it is a whole different story. But what's your average baseline in your aquifer? Tom mentioned earlier the well monitoring program. The county engineering department has a basic data portion which monitors stream flows. We have a network of rain gauges that are manned by volunteers throughout the county. And we also have a number of um, groundwater wells that are on our monitoring program. And they, wells are monitored twice a year. We do an April measurement and an October measurement to catch you know, the maximum winter recharge and then the maximum summer depletion. And those, it's a strictly voluntary program. It used to have two people staffing it year round. We now have had one person and that person's facing retirement. We do not know the status of that program. The, when we went down from two people to one people, what was lost was data reduction. We can go out and collect the numbers still, but nobody has done anything with that information. And we mentioned earlier on the confidentiality issues of the groundwater levels. They cannot be rede released to the public because they are private information that people have voluntarily allowed us to collect. But we have to reduce them and put them into a report presentation format before they can be released to the public. The other monitoring that is going on is the USGS does do some surface water monitoring. They um, operate some stream gauges throughout the county also. U United States Geologic Survey. Any good moderator uh, has to uh, quickly realize when they've lost control. <laughs> and in the interest of time, I'm going to draw close to the second segment. We hope you found this program informative and will join us next time for the next segment from our panel on water. For any information on this program or any other programs, please contact the League of Women Voters. Mm -hmm.